For a long time, my knowledge of the Bible was based mainly on what I'd heard about it from other people. I'd read bits and pieces here and there, and found it quite hard going. Most of it is hardly what you'd call a page-turner. Christians kept telling me that the criticisms I had of their religion were unfounded, and that rather than listening to other atheists, I should read the Bible myself. So, last year when I started a new job which allowed me to listen to my MP3 player with earphones for several hours of each shift, I decided to make use of this time by listening to an audio version of the Bible. I didn't just listen to it once through. I listened to the whole thing three times, and some parts many more. A lot of it was dull and repetitive, much of it was barbaric and cruel, some parts were kind of pleasant, and a few bits, such as the Book of Jonah, were hilarious. I've never been a Christian, but I still wanted to understand this religion better, out of curiosity. It seems to me that a very large percentage of modern Christians haven't even read their own holy book. Many churches seem to discourage their followers from doing this, particularly when it comes to the Old Testament. This boggles my mind. I find it very hard to imagine how people can be so sure about something when they haven't even bothered to fact-check what their pastors are saying by reading the scriptures themselves. I know that I am restricted to seeing the world through my own eyes only, but this strikes me as a stunning lack of curiosity. Most Christians claim that their God is unchanging and eternal, which means that the character of Yahweh as described in the book of Exodus, when he hardens Pharaoh's heart in order to smite the Egyptians over and over, is exactly the same deity which Jesus describes and claims to be related to, and who speaks from the clouds, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. Christians say that Yahweh is the God of love. To me, this seems a bit of a stretch. Sure, there are some places in which he is portrayed as being nice to his chosen people, and even to the Gentiles later on, but in the first half of the Old Testament he's anything but nice, kind, or tolerant. It also seems odd to me that our society has become so used to the idea of one super-god that when someone talks about God in the English-speaking world, we can be pretty sure they mean Yahweh. From now on I'm going to ask which God whenever someone says God. I mean, why leave it open to confusion? There are so many to choose from. Having read the whole Bible from cover to cover, I can confidently say that Yahweh does change. I don't know where Christians get the idea that he's eternal and unchanging from. It's certainly not the Bible. Or perhaps I should clarify, some parts of the Bible say he's unchanging, but others don't. Jesus, as an earthbound manifestation of Yahweh, tells us that we should love our enemies and feed and clothe them if they require it. Compare this with Yahweh in Numbers 31, when he commands that Phinehas take twelve thousand men and massacre the Midianites. They brought back the females, and Moses was angry with them, and commanded that all the non-virgins be slaughtered. There were thirty-two thousand left, which the Israelites took for wives. When we consider that Moses was Yahweh's spokesman at this point in the story, we must assume that he actually wanted this massacre to happen. If you think I'm singling out a rare instance of Yahweh's genocide, be assured this is only one of dozens, if not hundreds, of similar atrocities carried out by, or on the instruction of, the supposed creator of the universe. The first and worst of all his genocides is all the way back in Genesis 6, when he decides that the solution to the problem of his creations apparently becoming evil is not only to drown the entire global human population, Yes, that includes children and pregnant women, but also every single plant and animal, the only exception being Noah, his three sons and their four unnamed wives, plus two or seven of every animal species. This story has been covered in great detail elsewhere, but a couple of things which I hadn't even thought about until recently are the fact that if the entire planet was covered with water, almost all sea and fresh water life would die if the salinity of the water was changed as it would have to be if all the Earth's mountains, including Everest, was covered. The other thing is that the eight humans inside would have to have been extremely cold-hearted to ignore the shouts, the terrified pleas, and the banging on the outside of the ark as the water levels rose. It also seems odd that when the waters receded, Noah had to send a bird out to see if it was safe to open the door, 
when a few short months before he had spoken to Yahweh directly. I'm sure there are a lot of Christians who would say, you're not supposed to take these stories literally. Okay, how should we interpret them? What morals are we supposed to draw from stories about a genocidal God? However, there are a great number of Christians who do interpret the Bible literally, especially in America, it seems. Some Christians argue that the Old Testament no longer applies and has been superseded by the New Testament. With the exception of blood sacrifices, all the Old Testament laws dictated to Moses on Mount Sinai still apply, at least according to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of Moses or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. In truth I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not even the smallest stroke of a letter will pass away from the law. So anyone who breaks the least of these commandments, or teaches others to do so, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices these commandments, and teaches them, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses the experts in the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And in case anyone doubts whether this is mentioned in the Old Testament, the law is permanent for all future generations. You must add nothing to what I command you, nor subtract anything from it, but keep the commandments of Yahweh your God, just as I lay them down for you. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2 Interestingly, a few chapters further on in Deuteronomy, there is something which looks like it could apply to Jesus. See what you think. Deuteronomy chapter 13 verse 1 If a prophet arises among you, offering some sign or wonder, and if he then tells you to follow other gods and worship them, do not listen to that prophet's words. Yahweh your God is testing you to find out if you love him with all your heart and soul. That prophet must be put to death. You must banish this evil from among you. My point about this is that the God of love, peace and forgiveness, which Christians tend to associate with Jesus, is very different from Yahweh of the Old Testament. It's like there's a disconnect going on. Serious Christians say that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, and that it is the ultimate source of their morality, but very few act like they mean it. It baffles me how anyone could actually get to know the character of Yahweh by reading the Bible and still think that he's worth worshipping. To me, a God who savours the smell of burning flesh and feels no guilt or empathy about the pain the unfortunate animal has to endure leading up to its final barbecue, seems to have the character qualities of a testosterone-driven angry young man. The mandatory requirement for submission and worship don't sway me either and the whole idea of loving and fearing him brings to mind stories of domestic violence. Why would anyone worship that? Why worship the God of genocide? When Christians tell me that I should love and worship their God, it's as if they're telling me I'm wrong to feel anything other than contempt for real people who actually have committed genocide. The good news is that the chances of Yahweh being real are very, very, very slim. So why do Christians worship him? I think it's partly because a lot of them don't know how bloodthirsty and despicable a lot of the Old Testament stories are. I think it's also partly due to the need some people feel to be thankful for the good things in their lives, and the concept of a creator God is a convenient, mythical being whom they've been persuaded by the religion actually wants this worship. I wish that more of the fundamentally religious people in this world would be receptive to new ideas and embrace their curiosity and doubt instead of being afraid of it. The more we learn about the natural world, the more obsolete the supernatural becomes, in my humble opinion. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.